So the function of a hub would be to constrain and to integrate. So it will bring activity from different regions in the brain into a common centre where the activity can be integrated. And so that's the function of a hub really, is to bring disparate activity from different places into something cohesive. If you think of it analogous to a road junction, that uh, different routes to different places are brought together at this common junction. And it's very true of particularly one hub in the brain, the posterior cingulate cortex, where a number of different networks actually in the brain are all represented within this one spatially local unit. We found that psilocybin deactivated these hub structures. So that was kind of surprising. We were thinking because people described the experience as being mind expanding. They refer to psychedelic drugs as uh, broadening consciousness. So it's kind of surprising to see that psilocybin actually decreased activity in these hub structures. The level of integration or connectivity between the hub structure and other regions which are usually actually especially connected with the hub was decreased, so there was a kind of literal disconnect. These hub structures are like the uh, shepherd or the herdsman or the conductor of an orchestra. So under psychedelics, it's like the conductor leaves the room and then the orchestra no longer plays its usual coherent stream and you don't have the usual harmony there. You have something a lot more sort of dissonant, maybe a lot more um, experimental perhaps. So people often describe the psychedelic state as being sort of a freeing of thinking, a kind of dissolving of our usual style of thinking. And so that's why people have vivid imagination, why our perception changes and becomes more kind of fluid and, and strange. That literal kind of constraining function of a hub to limit, to keep things together, to keep things working synchronously, seems to be associated with a consistent and a, and a coherent narrative. It keeps things predictable and there's a certain familiarity to our experience that our interactions with the world aren't surprising and they don't feel especially novel. We can experience novel things and be captivated by them, but we can also explain them away quite quickly. They lose their novelty and we're not too perturbed by them. But in the psychedelic state, we can be very perturbed by things in the world as we go about and experience them. And in general, the state seems to have a kind of underlying uncertainty this kind of strangeness of our experience of the world is very prevalent. The visual system is a classic example of how the brain is organised hierarchically. So you have at the very, very lowest level the retina, light sensitive cells, and then you have that information passed on to the visual nuclei of the thalamus, this hub in the middle of the brain, and then you get that information sent back to the primary visual cortex, and then it's passed up into high level representations, you know, all the way up to faces. And what you see with psychedelics is that the visual modality particularly is disturbed. What people often report is things like geometric hallucinations, motion, hallucinated motion in things that are static. So they may describe the walls breathing, things melting, and they may see faces in things as well. So what you're seeing is that at levels of the visual hierarchy where you usually have that function sort of suppressed out, that region may do that function. It may Sort of offer a model or a prediction of a face or of motion but it's usually suppressed it's kept quiet then under a psychedelic there's a breakdown of the entire hierarchy in such a way that layers of the hierarchy can become manifest so you can start seeing faces popping out of walls and and this kind of thing it is it's a perceptual error but it's a function of how the perceptual system works so what we're seeing are predictions they're the brain's predictions, but they're just wrong predictions. So we might predict this face in the wall because the brain's very adept at predicting faces because they're everywhere um, and we're often processing faces. But you're just seeing something which should be suppressed out come up and then, and then you get these errors. I mean, so its implications are quite profound because it suggests where's the reality without a brain to piece together and to construct reality. So it's saying very strongly that reality is a construction. At least that's what the science is telling us, is that we construct reality. And that when we're infants and before then, we have a very, in a sense, we just have pure unreality. Reality only becomes something as we piece it together. So long as you recognize that that is a construction, it's not necessary to do away with the whole thing and start a new construction. It's just necessary to be 
aware of it. In the psychedelic state, people often get kind of giggly and things are kind of silly and funny. But there's also deeper levels to this term of regression. In psychotherapy in the 50s and 60s, it was found um, that people sometimes had vivid recollections or even relivings of past experiences. And in these cases, sometimes they'd go as far as to say that they felt like they were a child again and that they were nine years old and this was happening and these, these events were playing out. People's style of thinking becomes much less analytical and perhaps rational and it becomes more magical, the more fantasy-based. And that suggests a kind of regression, perhaps not just on an individual development level, but actually on a kind of evolutionary level, as if we go back to a, a state in our evolution where we did think more primitively, more kind of magically, more animistically. People often refer to ego disintegration or ego dissolution. And what's interesting about these hubs is that there's increasing evidence that they're part of a network which seems to subserve our sense of self or our ego, if you prefer that term. When people describe ego disintegration, when we're looking at the biology with our neuroimaging methods, we're actually seeing a literal disintegration of this network. And so if you think this network is the self, we're seeing a literal disintegration of the self. The classic psychotherapeutic approach in the 50s and 60s was psychoanalytic. It was Freudian and it was Jungian. And it was the idea that we usually carry a lot of stuff that we keep repressed, we keep from our ego, because it doesn't sit well with who we like to think we are. The use of psychedelics in the 50s and 60s, the rationale really was to remove the ego defences, remove the top-down stuff. But somehow I don't seem like I myself. I feel as though I'm several other people, and all of them better. <laughs> and get at and some very deep, salient emotions and memories, and then that could be worked through in, in psychotherapy. And you do see it. I mean, we saw it in our work with psilocybin that we had a volunteer have a spontaneous recollection of a very painful memory, a traumatic memory. I mean, he was fine, and after the experience we talked about it a lot, and he seemed to learn something from this experience coming up under the drug. But during it, he said it was profoundly disturbing, that he felt, and he used the words reliving, he said he felt like he was reliving that experience, that he was back there, and then he described some of the actual details of, of the experience itself. So this was quite profound. It wasn't, there was nothing that prompted it. This happened spontaneously. We did do a, an aspect of our fMRI work where we had um, our volunteers provide us with personal memories. And so these were presented to them in the scanner. And they would see these memories and then we would look at the brain activation to the memories, both under placebo and under psilocybin. And we actually found that activations in the brain were greater when people were under psilocybin than under placebo. So that was kind of interesting and it fitted actually that people described their recollections as being more vivid and more visual and more emotional under psilocybin versus placebo and, and we saw these activations. In terms of where those activations were, we were actually predicting that they might be in key memory centres like the hippocampus and, and emotion arousal centres like the amygdala. We didn't actually find that. Those regions were activated, but they were activated under placebo and under psilocybin. But what we did find is that sensory regions were significantly more active under psilocybin. So this may fit the subjective reports that people's memories were more vivid, they were more visual, because it was as if they were literally seeing them. They weren't just imagining them, they were really sensing them and I think people can be overwhelmed by their memory. And so this can actually account for some of the scary experiences that people have with psychedelics. They're certainly not always positive, and actually there's probably an equal amount of positive and negative experiences that you see, or at least a, the potential for that, unless you have good mediation of the experience and, and proper care and guidance for the individual. And the key consideration is that when this happens, that you allow them to experience it with a view to them learning something from it. That it's a problem that will never go away. It's just being pushed out of consciousness, pushed out of the ego, but it's always there. And it comes back with a vengeance under a psychedelic, but there may be something useful that you can do with that. You can re-compartmentalize things. You can understand that trauma and no longer have to push it down into the depths of your psyche.
But the key thing about how it could be therapeutically useful is what's done post-session, really. You can do some work during the session, but often they're in a kind of chaotic state where their dynamics are loosened and their, their thinking isn't entirely coherent. But what happens afterwards is that they have a long period of kind of working through and integration and just thinking about and hopefully talking about their experience and trying to make sense of it. And they'll have learned a hell of a lot and they don't have any amnesia of what they've experienced most of the time. And so it's useful and it can benefit them that this stuff's come up and then ha having come down from the drug, they can then kind of resort their files and maybe something which before they kept from their ego, but was nevertheless always there and always causing them some kind of anxiety, they can now have a file for and they can say, okay, that's part of me. I know it was painful, I know it's something that maybe I don't want to be part of me, but it is, and then they can have some kind of peace and potentially closure of that issue. And so that's how it could be therapeutic. So both in loosening up a kind of overly um, reinforced um, negative thought loops in, in terms of sort of breaking that down, but also getting at some core material that otherwise would be sort of obstructed by over analytical thinking. But there's a function in having an analytic, rational mind with good, precise reality testing that we um, can judge interactions in the world with a certain degree of precision in that we're not too perhaps swayed by what we'd like to believe or by what we would fear to be true, that we have this very rational, sort of sober way of looking at things. But equally, that kind of analytical thinking can be obstructive sometimes in terms of kind of personal development and how we're socialized and, and sort of made into members of the community um, is about building up the box and uh, that can be useful and you you know that's the basis of education and you learn your uh, schemas of the world you model the world in a particular way and understand it and interpret it in a, in a particular way but there's a potential there that your box can become too rigid so what psychedelics seem to have the capacity to do is to weaken these constraints that make up the box so that you can think outside of the box. And when you do that, you can potentially be more creative. You've got a more supple mind, more open-minded. That may have some benefits. One of the presenters today showed some evidence that the trait of openness, which is actually increased by psychedelics, is linked to economic productivity. So people with this trait of openness actually have higher levels of income, maybe because they're more supple in their thinking and in their behavior. They're prepared to be a bit inventive and think outside the box. And maybe if psychedelics promote this style of thinking, then that could have some economic benefits. Equally, if we become too defensive about things, we become too stuck in perhaps introspection, we may get too removed from the world and stuck in our own heads. You know, our thought loops might become kind of stereotyped. People who are depressed, classically, are very low on openness. They've got a very rigid state of mind. You have an overly reinforced pattern. It has a certain flavor which is overly pessimistic. We are literally seeing this in, in the brain dynamics that you have an overly constrained system. It's too stuck and it just goes round and round in this stuck form. And psychedelics seem to disturb that and then allow the kind of wonder and stray and looseness to the network that you would want for psychological health, or at least for open-mindedness, creativity, and that kind of flexible style of thinking. And also, it's a very costly disorder, massively costly, very expensive. People don't work, they stay at home, and their productivity levels go down to zero, essentially. And also, it costs money to look after them. So if you can treat depression, if you can increase this kind of supple way of thinking, mediate it in the right way so that people can learn from the experience, then you can help them both in terms of their health and also potentially in terms of their general well-being and kind of lifestyle that they could, they could be more productive individuals. Another condition where you see overly reinforced patterns of activity and behavior is addiction. So people have a compulsion to go again and again back to this behavior, which is dysfunctional and it's not doing them any good. You know, let's say it's alcohol dependence and they just have to drink. What psychedelics may do in those conditions is to disturb those overly reinforced 
behaviours which rest on overly reinforced patterns of brain activity. So they get in there and it's a bit like a snow dome if you want, and they'll shake up the snow dome, loosen the reinforced connections and then allow things to reform. And if you, if you mediate, again, it's all about how the experience is mediated really. If you mediate it in the right way, then that can work and people can, can potentially break those reinforced patterns and hopefully get better. And I think our normal waking consciousness is very habitual and actually it probably forms so that we aren't surprised by the world, so that we reduce novelty to its lowest level or surprise or uncertainty to its lowest level. That means we in inhabit a very steady familiar world and we might feel comfortable in that world but there may be a danger that our models of our world that we formed do become too rigid, too ossified. It could be more of a dramatic effect when that ossification is broken down. Those people will be able to question whether their view of the world is correct and actually you often see these kind of crises really, you know, maybe existential crises you might call them, where a way of thinking which they've clung to for so long then becomes questioned uh, under a psychedelic. I would say that that's healthy. It can also be very disturbing for people. So you have to be ready for those kind of possibilities and, and to mediate someone through a, a crisis of that sort. I think there is a danger in, in any way certainly promoting psychedelic use recreationally because it can be done in the wrong way. And that sounds a bit loaded, you know, but it can be done in a reckless way, in an irresponsible way. It can be done in a way that people don't learn from the experience, they're just shocked and frightened by the experience. So that's the danger. But if all recreational use was done in a very controlled, well-mediated way, perhaps if people could go to centres, organised places where they could have a psychedelic experience mediated in the right way, yet they weren't psychologically unwell, then I, I, I think there's a case for that. It would be unfair to say you can only have a psychedelic experience if you're psychologically unwell because its only place is psychotherapy for mental illness. It's just the key thing is that the experience is mediated properly.